Amen. We're still in our series on the Holy Spirit at large. And um, in the last two weeks, we've, 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 we've dived into a sub-series of that um, as we talk about the seven spirits of God. And, uh, of course, last week I kind of went into an introduction to that, of, of what that represented and how, um, you know, it was basically emblematic of these imageries that we, we see in, <clears throat> in the book of Revelations, a lot in the book of Revelations, but also in the Old Testament with the prophets. And I talked about how that lamp of God, in one sense, represented the Holy Spirit. And the seven spirits of God that we see in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2 um, to 4, and also in Revelations um, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Um, and, and so we're, we're, we're building on that. We're now going into the different spirits of God. So if you will run back to that scripture in Isaiah in the Old Testament... You'll see where we're at tonight and what we will talk about tonight. So Isaiah chapter 11, we were there last week, and it's kind of going to be the basis of our teaching for the next few weeks. Um, Isaiah chapter 11. And for those who were not here last week, it was basically just an introduction to those seven spirits of the Lord. One of the spirits we had already taught about a few weeks ago before we got into this sub-series um, and that was the Spirit of the Lord. We talked about the Spirit of the Lord a few weeks ago. So, of course, I didn't think it was necessary to revisit what we've already done. So we're going to kind of focus on the other six spirits. Um, <clears throat> Isaiah 11, verse 1. There shall come from forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord, which is number one. That's the first spirit there. Now, the Spirit of the Lord there, um, <clears throat> If some people will read this and say, well, this talks about six spirits of God. Well... The Spirit of the Lord is a manifestation of the Spirit of God. If, if you've kind of followed through from what we've been teaching, I, I've talked about how the different titles or the different names of the Holy Spirit that speak to his different features or attributes or manifestations or the different folds of the Holy Spirit speak, speak of how he manifests in different ways. It's not different spirits, right? We're, we're, we're not a polytheistic religion uh, worshiping different gods or God in different forms. Uh, <clears throat> we're serving one God, but we can see God in different manifestations. Because there were people who God revealed himself to as healer. He is God your healer. There were people he revealed himself to based on the situation that they were dealing with as provider. God will reveal himself to you in different ways based on your need. There are people, if you've never been sick before, you've never needed healing. If you've never been poor before, you've never needed the blessing of wealth. Right? So you cannot... You, you will not fully understand a certain message or dimension of God till you go through what you need in relation to that dimension of God, right? There are certain things in my life I have never had to deal with. So, I may not have experienced God in that dimension like somebody who has had to go, go through that, right? I've never gone through divorce. Other people have gone through divorce, so they're going to have, if they're Christians, if they're believers, if they're children of God, they would have experienced the manifestation of God's goodness in that sense, in a way I haven't. They will receive a ministry of the Lord to them in that dimension, right? <clears throat> and so we see God showing himself as diff in this different dimension, you know, in, with, in Abraham's case, he showed himself to be Jehovah Jireh. Right? The Lord provides. When, of course, we see the story of him, the Lord telling him to sacrifice his son Isaac. And he didn't know what he was going to eventually do. He thought, okay, God has said it, so I'm going to do it. And here is his son, who he's about to sacrifice. They're walking up the mountain saying, where is the lamb that we're going to slaughter? And he says, I don't know, but then that's how we get the word Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. Right? And so, and he did. He did because he got up there. He was about to kill Isaac and sacrifice him on that altar. And, of course, what happens out there in the rustling bush? 
uh -uh, comes around exactly <laughs> and God provided the lamb that was to be sacrificed right so in that mode he saw God has his provider now all of us have different testimonies and from your testimony you will see the revelation of God in a different sense right if you've been delivered from being a drunk junkie or into drugs or alcohol or that kind of addiction that's how you're gonna see your Lord your Lord and your Savior as your deliverer from that if your testimony was of God healing you you're going to see him as your balm of Gilead your deliverance from that if it was saving you from something you're gonna see him as your Savior if he protected you from danger an accident whatever you will see him as the Lord your shield your protector you know the difference so when we talk about these folds these names of God whether it's God the Father God this God the Son or God the Holy Spirit we're speaking to his attributes we're speaking to the dimensions of revelation of who he is now we know God to be incomprehensible right he's so large that you cannot comprehend but what the Bible does is I believe gives us a glimpse a glimpse not the full package but a glimpse of what we need for now Moses asked to see the face of God the glory of God God says you cannot stand my full glory but God gave him just a glimpse just a glimpse of it and and, and in this world all we're going to have is a glimpse that is why God gives us some answers but not every answer sometimes he'll give you the answer but not at the moment you're seeking it it will come later on but he gives us answers in glimpses and so that's how we're seeing him today and we're seeing these seven spirits of the Lord so we, we know we talked about the spirit of the Lord and today we'll talk about the spirit that's if we read verse 2 the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him speaking about Christ the spirit of wisdom and understanding you know I thought I was gonna be able to combine wisdom and understanding and realized it would be too much for one evening so we're gonna just go with wisdom um, the two the two concepts are intrinsically linked in Scripture um, you don't have one without the other but the fact that they are linked together does not mean they are the same all right they are distinct and we'll see that difference in, in between this week and next week um, Proverbs 9 verse 10 you'll see this connection a lot in, in a few scriptures that I'll read Proverbs 9 verse 10 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and with all thy getting get understanding you see that link beginning to build Proverbs 4 verse 7 wisdom is the principal thing therefore get wisdom and with all thy getting get understanding Proverbs 3 verse 13 blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding so you're seeing it's not the same thing it's different but they're always going there there it's like they're brothers and sisters or siblings to each other you know Proverbs 2 verse 1 to 5 my son if you accept my words and store up my commands within you turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding indeed if you call out for insight which is another word for wisdom and cry aloud for understanding understanding so they go side by side but they're not the same so we're going to focus on the wisdom element tonight the spirit of wisdom the concept of God's divine wisdom as he wants us to receive it the Greek word for wisdom is the word sophos like Sophia or Sophie you know s-o-p-h-o-s -O -O you know sophos that's the Greek word for wisdom divine wisdom and it means the Greek word there means the ability to judge correctly the ability to judge correctly and the ability to follow the best course of action based on knowledge and understanding so you're able to judge correctly and see what is right what the right decision for something is based on knowledge so you've got wisdom that stands on knowledge and understanding. those are the two pillars that wisdom stands on say with me knowledge and understanding but they're not the same things knowledge is different from wisdom knowledge is what you gather over time 
by coming to study the Word of God, by coming to church, by spending time with the Lord. The, the Lord wants you to know Him for yourself. David says, Lord, I pray that I may know you. I may know your ways, right? That is knowledge. You get to understand God more. You grow in your knowledge of Christ. That's knowledge, but that's not wisdom. It can be said that wisdom in turn acts properly upon knowledge, right? Wisdom is your action upon the knowledge that you have received, upon the knowledge that you've built. What do you do with what you have received from the Lord? That's wisdom. How do you apply what you have been taught? Taught on Sunday, taught on Wednesday, taught in your devotional time with the Lord. The application of that knowledge that you have gained is wisdom. But wisdom is not the knowledge itself. Knowledge understands that the light there has turned red or green or yellow. And wisdom applies the brakes. It's the response. All right. Uh, Exactly. It is the response. Knowledge basically sees the quicksand, but wisdom tells you to get around it and not to walk straight into it. Knowledge will help you memorize the Ten Commandments, right? You go through the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter. Who can tell me where the ex what Exodus I've given you already, the first book. Where do you find the Ten Commandments, people? Before. <laughs> true, true that. I'm looking for a chapter. Where do you find the Ten Commandments? If your kid was to ask you, show me in the Bible where the Ten Commandments are to be found. Exodus chapter 20. There you go. Thank you for saving the congregation of God's people. <laughs> Exodus chapter 20. That's where you find it. That's, uh, that's knowledge. You know the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shall not. Worship any other God but the Lord your God. Thou shalt not make any graven image. You know, all of that. Thou shalt honor your father and your mother. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. All of the Ten Commandments. That's knowledge. You've memorized it. You've learned your John 3.16. You've learned your Romans 3 verse 23. Your John 1 verse 1. Your Psalm 150. Your Psalm 23. Your Matthew chapter 5. The Sermon. The Beat, all of that great stuff is knowledge. And God wants you to gain knowledge of him and knowledge of his word. Applying that knowledge you've gotten... That's what wisdom is. That you apply that knowledge to good. You put it to good use. You put it to good use. Knowledge learns of God. Wisdom loves him. You're practicing it. You're putting it into action. You're acting properly on it. It's the fitting application of knowledge. That's what wisdom is. Proverbs 9 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom starts with God and ends with God. True wisdom, however, not earthly wisdom as we will see. And the knowledge of the Holy One, that scripture says, is understanding. Friends, the Holy Spirit wants to impart in you and I his wisdom. Because he's the spirit of wisdom. He wants every Christian, every Christian ought to experience the different realities and dimensions that the Holy Spirit can bring to bear on your behalf. He wants to be the spirit of the Lord in your life. How? By bringing the power of God into action in your life like he did for so many others in scripture. He wants to be the spirit of wisdom in your life. How? By giving you divine heavenly wisdom. Wisdom that will help you get through this life. He wants to be the spirit of understanding that we'll talk about next week. He wants to give you deeper understanding into the deepest things of God. Scripture says the Holy Spirit searches the deepest, thing, the deepest things of God. And he wants to give you that understanding. He wants to give you counsel. He wants to give you might. He wants to empower you. He wants to impart in you wisdom. But the Bible speaks of two different kinds of wisdom. Turn your Bibles to the New Testament. James, James has a lot to say about wisdom. And wisdom that comes from God. And wisdom that's not of God. The book of James. The book of James. Chapter 1. But we'll be uh, focusing on chapter 2. But I, just, just one popular verse in chapter 1. You probably already know it. But we'll just still go there. The book of James after the book of Hebrews. I was like, Hebrews. I don't know. You know that's, 
James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If you ask the Lord in faith for wisdom, he will give it to you. He wants to give you wisdom because that is part of who he is. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom. Now go to chapter 2 of that same book, James chapter 2, verse 13. And we're going to read downwards. James 2, verse 13. Actually, that is wrong. I wrote the wrong verse. Give me a second, and I will get the right. Yeah, it's not chapter 2, it's chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 13. I had it written wrong there. Chapter 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? you, you again, you see this continuing friendship between wisdom and understanding. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom, verse 15, does not descend from above. So he introduces you to you a type of wisdom, and it's not God-given wisdom. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it's earthly. It's sensual. We'll, we'll focus on those things in a little bit. It's demonic. It's demonic. For wherever, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above, everyone say above, is first, number one, pure, then peaceable, then gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So we've got wisdom of the world and we've got wisdom of God. And no person better exemplifies the contrast or clear difference between heavenly wisdom and earthly wisdom and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus tries to build a picture of contrasts between the two different types of wisdom. The heavenly wisdom and the earthly wisdom. They serve different masters. They have different ends. They have different goals. That's why you hear Jesus say something like, you've heard it being said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The concept of that you love only your friends, but you hate your enemies. Perfectly normal in Old Testament times. And he says, but I say unto you, love your... Hmm. Now think about that. That right there. Now, don't think about you, Terry, the spend decades following Jesus and learn the word of God. All right. Think about I'm not a Christian. I don't know anything about the word of God. I just live like, you know, most other people just out there in the world, just living my life. And someone says, you know what you should do? You've always thought it a good idea to love your family and your friends. But I want you to go way beyond that. I actually want you to love those who hate you and despise you and persecute you. Folks, that right there was revolutionary. No other person had taught that you should love those who hate you. Because the world had always existed on the idea that if you hit me, what do I do? I hit you back. We literally live in that world system today. If the nation of Iran was to send a missile to the coast of the United States, they don't have the capabilities of that currently, only about a couple of nations in the world do. But if they were to send a ballistic missile, Russia does have that, and it hit the United States or attacked the U.S. Navy, you know, one of the aircraft carriers, whether it's Ford or whatever out there, or a fighter jet, an F-35, F-16, F-22, whatever it is, we would say it's a declaration of war. That is our default response, is that if you hit me, we hit you back. That was what the Iranians tried to use as a justification, because 
Israel a few weeks ago, you know, decided to hit their generals in Syria, in the, in the, in the consulate. So the Iranians were like, well, we're going to have to retaliate, and we're going to retaliate hard. And what they did was send over 300 drones and missiles to Israel, right? That's the concept of how the world works. You hit me, I hit you back. We're cool, we're chill, we're even, right? You, thread, you traded a blow, I gave you one back. That seems to be perfectly acceptable to the human understanding. But it is only because that is human wisdom. Human wisdom says, you mind your business, I mind my business. You don't do me wrong, I don't do you wrong. Everybody can live with that. Jesus flips this whole idea completely on its head and says, do not just love your family. Do not just love your friends. He even says, if you do that, you're basically doing something the Gentiles also do, which is true. I want you to love your enemies. I want you to forgive them when they try to hurt you and persecute you. I want you to pray for them. Do you know how incredibly difficult it is to love your enemies? Now, we think of it in the abstract, and so we don't think of it to be so difficult. But if, think about if somebody killed your son or your daughter. Think about it in that sense. Do you have the capacity to forgive them? You don't, but with Christ, you can on your own, we wouldn't want to do that. And Jesus says, don't just forgive them, love them. Oh, and he even uses the idiomatic expression, which is turn the other cheek. Oh, that, my friends, is revolutionary. But it is only because it is, it contains divine wisdom that's from above and not from the earth. Jesus makes this contrast. In Matthew chapter 5, in no other scripture but Matthew chapter 5, does he make these contrasts a, a ton. I mean, he makes this contrast a lot. He talks about divorce. He says, Moses has said, if a man wants to divorce his wife, he shall give his wife a certificate of divorce. In the case of indecency, it's open. So, basically, the Jew thinks, okay, if I can find any crazy enough reason to divorce my wife, I am fine before God. And Jesus says, no, I'm going to take you way, way further. You shall not divorce your wife except the only permissible case. And he doesn't even say do it in that instance. He only says that is a justifiable instance for you to do it. That means if that happens, first seek to resolve. And then if you can't, then you can be justifiably right to go for a divorce. Because God hates divorce. As much as common as it is in our society, God still hates the idea or concept of divorce. It doesn't mean you are a worse or you're a bad person because you went through a divorce. No, God loves you all the same. But as a preacher, both pastor and I, our goal is not to meet you at your level. Our goal is to set the standard that Christ calls us to. I've, I drive a lot, you know, driving Uber and stuff. I meet a lot of people who are Christians. In fact, the other day I met this guy, picked him up at 1 a.m. in the morning from a club. And then he was like, ah, oh, I don't know how what he got to you. And he was like, ah, oh, you know, um, what kind of music are you interested in? Into? Normally when that question comes up, I always say, eh, just pick up, pick up what, whatever you like because I don't, I'm not a big fan of secular music anyway, so I don't really care much about it. Um, and then he pushed me a little bit. Like, what kind of music do you like? I was like, well, if you wanted to die, I like Christian music. He was like, oh, really? And then we started, we get in and we're talking about Christian music and blah, blah, blah. Now, here's the thing. The fleshly, earthly wisdom of me will want to compromise and meet him as a level. Right? I've picked up a lot of people. I've picked up drunk couples who tell me, oh, seven hours from now we're going to be at church. And they're drunk out of their mind. Right? Okay. My job is not to condemn them. Absolutely not. But my job is also not to show up on Sunday morning and try to justify being drunk. That is the struggle a lot of American preachers have. They know in their church, in their pews, there are people seated there who are struggling with different sins. We all have things we're going to struggle with. The Lord is our help. 
But because people in your church struggle with certain things, whether it's drunkenness, whether it's whatever it is, you do not neutralize the word of God. You don't tone down because, oh, I know Joe and Jill smoke or they drink. They know it's sin. Most Christians who sin know it's sin. They don't need you to tell them, oh, well, maybe God loves you and it's not sin. They know it is because the Holy Spirit is already working in their hearts, telling them, yeah, you're struggling with it, but you are more than this. You are the righteousness in Christ. You can be free from this. You are not supposed to recoil and go, I know Sister Mary and Joe cuss a lot. So if I say something, uh, they may think I'm targeting them. That's not your job. Your job is to still set the standard. So that's what you're going to get. You're going to get the standard. Yeah, I know all of our pews, we're going to have people struggle with sin. But I am not going to reduce the standard because I want to meet the people where they are. I tell them, you come to Jesus as you are, but he does not leave you as you are. He wants you to become like him, and he will empower you to become like him. But earthly wisdom says, oh, no, no, let's come down to their level. That's how American society has evolved. Because people have always thought, oh, if we meet you down there, you're going to stop there. But what's happened is we meet people who say we should compromise down there, and then the next year they sink further and want us to go further. In the 1990s, the LGBTQ community pushed the idea, we just want to be respected as normal people. The bar was pushed. People did that. Then it came to the early 2000s where it says, we don't want to be married. We don't want to be recognized as a marriage. We just want civil unions. All right, I was not in America then, but I watched a lot of American TV growing up to know this. So you should. During the days of, from George Bush 2004 presidential election, to 2008, the idea was, okay, we don't want gay marriage. We just want gay civil unions so that we can enjoy the legal privileges. Most people moved there. When that was gotten, oh, no, actually, we want marriage. Obergerfeld, 2015. It didn't stop there. Oh, if you don't bake cakes for us, we're going to sue you and throw you in jail. No, it doesn't stop there. Come 2024, if you don't believe that I am a man, even though I'm clearly a woman, you are the one who is insane, and you should be thrown in jail for hate speech. Amen. 30 years, what happened? It started from, we just want to live our lives and not be judged, to, if you don't even ascribe to our irrational, ridiculous belief, we want to throw you in jail. You don't go down to where people are at. You call them up to where Christ wants them to be. It doesn't mean you hate them. It doesn't mean you judge them. It means you keep the standard the standard. Because when you sit down, what do you do? You succumb to the wisdom of the world. And Christ says, now, let's be honest. Of all the standards that Christ set in Matthew chapter 5 with the wisdom of God, when he says, has there been any Christian who has ever truly done 100% of that? No. No. Most times when someone throws a punch at me, my first reaction is to get that punch back to their face. Before I have the second to think, ah, Jesus said, do not do that. Oh, too late. It's already done on me. Oh, or you're driving in the traffic. Somebody tries to flip you over. You know, the other, a few weeks ago I was, you know, driving. We're coming to church actually, funny enough. And for some reason, this guy decides to pull right in front of us and slams his brake right in front of me. And I lost being a pastor for about 10 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Olivia was like, Stoney, if you're going to church, stop. <laughs> That's not our normal physical reaction. But Christ did not set the standards because he thought we would not live according to that. He set that standard because it was heavenly wisdom. And he knows we operate all the time in earthly, fleshly wisdom. Jesus says, ah, oh, you've heard it says adultery is what we think adultery is. He says, no, actually, 
Adultery is, if you even look at a woman lustful in your eyes, you've committed adultery in your heart. He's setting the standard because he understands you could never meet it. But he's setting it all the same. You now know. How many of us know that the Jewish people generally are one of the richest people in the world? I've always been, okay? Now, a lot of anti-Semites go, oh, the Benjamins and whatever. Okay, the simple reasons why the Jews have always been richer and seem to be more wealthy than everybody else is pretty simple. You go back to Genesis. God says, I will bless you and I will bless your descendants. They just have what you would call the Midas touch, right? Because God does not retract his promises. Even though a lot of them don't know Jesus, sadly, that blessing is still there. Because God said it and he doesn't take back his word. All right? That's the simple reason. If you wanted to know, it's not some conspiracy theory. All the Jews are taking over the world. No, it's simple. God's hand has been on them. That's the reason why they've been there as long as they've been. Right? His hand has been on them. Now, in the Jewish thought, right, because of things like the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes, they had, the, the Jews were very good at making money. Very good at it. All right? So, you've been a Jew serving God. It was perfectly okay to be very wealthy. Uh, Abraham was wealthy. Joseph was wealthy. <laughs> you say, no, he wasn't. Yeah, he was. Well, prime minister of Egypt. Uh, tell me any prime minister who is not wealthy. Abraham, Job. I mean, go down the list. All these people were all wealthy. And God promises those, promised those blessings to people who would obey his commandments, right? So, this Jewish guy who is really rich shows up around Jesus. And he's talking about what? Oh, what do I need to be, you know, in the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, go home, sell all you have. He's like, all right, I mean, that part I'm not going to do. I'm not ready to sell all I have. Why? Because Jesus was calling him to what? Store up your treasures where what? Moth and the bugs cannot attack, right? In heaven. But the idea that it always had was to build wealth on the earth. Not that there's anything wrong intrinsically with that, but it had earthly wisdom to it. What's the American dream? Grow up, go to college, get married, have a really good job that has a good 401k and retirement. 40 years later, you retire, you have your kids, you have cars, you you can travel around the world. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. It's wrong when that becomes your goal and your end point. Because that's earthly wisdom, right? Earthly wisdom. Oh, you want to be an entrepreneur. You want to open up businesses. You want to be rich. Make a lot of money because you want to feel powerful. You want to hang out with all the powerful people. You want to be able to, you know, if you're rich enough and you can donate $100,000 to any of the presidential candidates, you sure can get a seat at their table. And you want to know how you can meet President Trump or President Biden in the next month, it's very easy. Donate $100,000 to any of their campaigns, and you will have a front seat table at one of their dinners, okay? There's nothing complex about that. If you've got $100,000 in the bank, you can afford to meet one of those two presidents in the next month, right? They need your money. American elections cost $2.3 billion the last time, so we spend a lot here. Not difficult, Right? If you have money, you can build connections. If you have money, you can build power. Right? That's the world system. Get more. Gather more. Invest more. Right? Wall Street. Right? Build a Fortune 500 company. Be like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. Make, be worth $300 billion. Have wealth. Great. Awesome. But what's that? That's earthly wisdom. It's sensual. You know why it's sensual? Because it's focused on me, 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 me. You want to know the biggest difference between heavenly wisdom and earthly wisdom? Earthly wisdom is always focused on you. Now, here's the thing. Here's the catch. It's not the thing that's bad. Money is not bad. It's the love of money that's bad. It's not the thing that's bad. God blessed and still blesses people with a lot of money, right? What's bad is the intention. In Kings, Solomon prays, one of the most famous prayers in the Bible, right? God appears to him and says, what do you want from me? What does he say? Give me wisdom. But he didn't just say that. He didn't say, Lord, I want you to give me wisdom. This is what he said. He said, Lord, give me wisdom so that I may be able to govern your people well. 
He wasn't asking wisdom for himself. Now, of course, God says, you know, you didn't ask of riches and all that. And, but look at the mindset. The mindset was not to get wisdom for just the sake of getting wisdom. Because there's nothing wrong with that. His goal, however, was to have wisdom so that he could rightfully lead, not his people, God's people. Now Solomon was really wealthy because God blessed him. And God saw the motivation in his heart. And so the wisdom God gives him is wisdom to lead God's people. Do you see? He had wealth. He had wisdom. He had all these good things. But the motivation was different. It was not for him to have enough wisdom so he could crush his enemies, his political foes. It was not so he could have enough wisdom so he could destroy all those who were his competitors. It was so he could have wisdom in order to lead God's people rightfully. That was the heart. That is the difference between heavenly wisdom and earthly wisdom. Earthly wisdom is focused on strategies to build your empire. Heavenly wisdom is focused on strategies to build God's empire. There is nothing with being rich. Praise God if he gives you the blessing to become a billionaire. But the difference between you worth $5 billion and the other guy out there worth $5 billion is that your vision for what God has given to you is different. The other guy doesn't see it as God's property, God's wealth. You do. And so you start to use it to propagate his gospel. When Jesus told that man to go sell all he had, he wasn't telling him, I only want poor people to follow me. He was basically saying to the man, I want me to be the sole attention and focus of your wealth. Watch this. Judas Iscariot was the treasurer of Jesus' ministry. You know that, right? He was a financial accountant. He was the CFO of Jesus' ministry. But what was he doing as CFO of Jesus' ministry? He had been already stealing. Now, is it Jesus' ministry he was treasurer over? Yes. He was in the right place. He was with the right person. I mean, the most right person in the world. Yet, his motive, his heart was not right. And so he was using, everything around him was right. But his heart was not right. That is demonic, sensual wisdom. What's your focus? Do you, are you building an empire for yourself? So when you see these great war generals, Alexander, Napoleon, these great military strategists... Hannibal the Great, who built empires. They had wisdom. They were smart people, but they were using their wisdom for my themselves. My name, my empire, my goals. If you switch and use your strategy, your wisdom for him and for his kingdom, then you have heavenly wisdom. Jesus never asks you to become poor. Jesus asks you to be rich for him if you're rich. Not for yourself. Not unto yourself. Earthly wisdom is about being smart and competitive and clever. You know, you, you, know, you, you talk about people like Machiavelli, political shrewdness. You know, Rockefeller, you know, these business successes. Stephen Hawking, academic brilliance. That's earthly wisdom. It's still wisdom. But it's in the wrong place and it's focused on the wrong thing. Now think about this, folks. The building of the Tower of Babel sounded like a very good idea, didn't it? It did. I mean, think about what they said. Come together. Let us build ourselves a tower. I mean, geez, right now, Oklahoma City, if you didn't know, it's been approved for the tallest building in the United States to be downtown Oklahoma City. Amen. Amen. I don't know what the tornadoes have to say about that. But we'll see. It's been approved. 
It's been approved. There's only one final signature that has to go for it. And the developer says they've secured financing of a billion dollars to build it. So we'll see. And the people with the Tower of Babel do it. There is, has God destroyed the tall skyscrapers around the world? No. God's problem was not in them building a tower. That was not his problem. His problem was that they were building it so they could become like him. God was not after, you know, you know how you teach kids the story of the Tower of Babel, and they were like, God doesn't like those, didn't like those tall buildings. No, that's not what he was about. <laughs> it was the motive. What were they trying to do? You can, be do? you can be doing the right thing, and if you have the wrong motive, you're walking in earthly wisdom and not in heavenly wisdom. Are you building your empire for yourself? When the serpents came in the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve, the idea in and of itself is not a bad idea, right? He says, you will be able to discern what is good and what's evil. You get knowledge. I mean, the Bible talks about us, say, seek knowledge. The book of Proverbs constantly says, seek to have more knowledge. There's nothing wrong with knowledge, right? But what was the goal? What was the end goal? The end goal was rebellion against what God had said. It wasn't them being more knowledgeable the devil knew that God could give Adam and Eve more knowledge if they asked for it. He's a, he's a liberal God. He wants to give freely to us. But the devil knew, if I can get them to put their eyes on that, I can get their eyes off God. That's where it was at. That was where devilish wisdom came from. Remember the story of Lot and how he separated from his uncle Abraham? Here he is. He looks at this lush, beautiful grassland. Man, he's like, that's what I want. There is nothing wrong with what Lot taught. They lived in an, in an agrarian agricultural society at the time. So wealth was from how good your land was. If you had good and arable land, you could be wealthy because you could have crops, bumper crops, and you could be really rich. You have great livestock. Yeah, he was not thinking wrong. His heart was what was wrong. And his heart got him in bed with people who despised God. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Not the action, the heart, the motive, the selfish motive, the sensual motive. And that's what James says. That's earthly wisdom. So let's read through that again as we finish tonight. We go back to James 3. James 3 verse 15. This wisdom does not descend from above. It's earthly. It's focused on the earth. It's sensual. What does it mean to be sensual? It means things that are dedicated towards your own pleasure. Temporary fleeting pleasure. Sensual. James 3 verse 15. Sensual, right? Wisdom that's dedicated to your power here on this earth. Your wisdom. You know, you've got all these PhDs and all these professors. And they go to school and be like, well, you got to call me doctor. You know professors are pretty proud about that. I spent 10 years going, you better call me doctor. <laughs> See, that was the most Nigerian American thing I'd ever seen. Because, you know, coming from a Nigerian society, they always use, you know, they say, oh, Mr. Uncle, Sir, right? And you come to the U.S. and people are like, oh, we call them by their first name. And I show up in class, and here is, I'm in a college algebra class, and this guy, this high school kid, he calls this woman by first name. And she turns over to him, this 52 white year old woman, and she says, no, you don't call me by my first name. You call me doctor, because that's what I am. <laughs> And she, she was, I mean, she would have failed that guy, I think, if he decided. She was proud. She was like, I've worked for this. So you give me the title that I deserve. That's what earthly wisdom seeks to do. It seeks to puff us up. Puff up our pride. 
puff up our ambitions, our goals, our empire. Our look at me. Look how beautiful I am. Yeah, you may look beautiful right now, but in 60 years, you wouldn't say that. It's like how, you know, these Hollywood stars like Leonardo DiCaprio, he's in his 50s. And he's like, oh, man, you know what's a good idea? To date women that are at least half my age. <laughs> it's like always get new wine. You know, we're done with the old stock. Oh, let's get the new younger women. Seems to be a thing in Hollywood, you know. Your beauty is fleeting. Your wealth is fleeting. Yeah, you might be Miss World. You were Miss World in 1980. You sure are no Miss World right now. There are hotter, more beautiful girls than you. And everybody's eyes are turned. Oh, there's the new thing. Boom. But, Jesus says, if you store up your treasure in heaven where the moth does not destroy, age doesn't destroy. The fact you got older does not mean that your wealth got more wrinkles because you stored it in the right place. That does not, there's no expiry date to it. There's no expiry date to it. But guess what? Even your so-called wish, you said, I'm the most brilliant guy. Yeah, but you now have Alzheimer's. You forgot everything that you spent 60 to 70 years studying. And you thought you were smart. And now you have it no more. So even that wealth of knowledge, I am smart. You know, you've got all these professors who are anti-God all the time. And they act like they're the smartest people in the world. I'm like, and you're going to just die like the homeless guy who has nothing. And you'll be in the same grave the next day. No different. No different. And Jesus says, no, you got to focus on heavenly. And so we read further. Verse 16, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing is there. Every war that we've ever seen in this world has been because of selfish reasons. World War I, the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, boom, many millions of men dead a few years later. World War II, Adolf Hitler decides, I'm going to take over the whole world. Selfish ambitions. Every war has always been from envy and self-seeking ambition. Verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. What's pure? If it's centered on God, it's pure. Because God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Then it's peaceable. Oh man, it's not the thing that brings war. It's not these brilliant military strategists. No, it's peaceable. Paul says you should live in peace with all men. Seek to live in peace with all men. It's gentle. That means you're not out there bragging to everybody. This is the wealth and knowledge I have built for myself. You may never win a Nobel laureate. But you've won the most coveted prize in heaven. It is willing to yield. It's full of mercy and good fruits. It's not partial. And it has no hypocrisy. That is the wisdom God wants you and I to have. And that wisdom can come from his Holy Spirit. And so as we finish tonight, you say, I want to walk in this wisdom. God wants you to have his wisdom. How do I? Get that wisdom. James says, you just ask for it. Pray that the Holy Spirit of God will fill you with wisdom in your day-to-day -day life. Man, we all have things we have to struggle with. Whether it's a job. You're like, God, I don't know. I'm lost. Wisdom. Relationships. Who you're dating. Who you want to marry. I'm lost. I don't know what the future holds for me. Wisdom. A few weeks ago, we prayed for a lady who was deciding if she should proceed with one treatment of cancer, as Pastor talked about. She was lost. And the church prayed for wisdom. And a few days later, God gave her wisdom on what course of action to pursue. That's wisdom. She already had knowledge of what she wanted to do, but she didn't know how to apply it. And so she says, God, give me wisdom. If any man lacks wisdom in your workplace, you're struggling with something that you can't quite figure out. Someone, you don't know how to talk to them about something. And you are just like, just look to God. The spirit of wisdom wants to work in you and give you options that you cannot see on your own. 
You know why? He doesn't just know all things. He doesn't just see all things. He knows the end from the beginning. And so in your little limited mind, you know, think about this. Okay, a lot of you will not connect. But look at yourself 30, 40, 50 years ago. You know, you broke up with some girlfriend or boyfriend in your room. We pee the whole day, heartbroken. And at that moment, I don't want nobody to talk with me. Watching your soap opera to drown your sorrows away. And you're like, God, I thought she was the one for me. <laughs> Funny story here. Okay. In college, I did it about two girls. Okay. The other four I didn't quite get to date that I kind of pursued to an extent. Three of them have turned out to be lesbians in the last four years. <laughs> so sometimes I said to myself, you know what, Lord? But then I was like. Oh, my goodness, she is so hot. I've got to get that girl. And God was like, mm, I'm not sure you want to be married to <laughs> a future lesbian. Now, in that moment, eight, ten years ago, all I can see is what's in front of me. God sees ten years down the line. And he's like, son, if I let you have your way, you're going to be in real trouble. Amen. Like my, I feel like my, my dad calling me and be like, ha, ha, Tony, mm, that America has infested your heart. <laughs> Come back to Nigeria. <laughs> Run away. I told you so. No. Thankfully, that did not happen. And the Lord spared me from that. But in the moment, and there were Christian girls at the time. Okay, this was not like I was there, a Christian guy trying to chase these Girls who didn't, they were just pretty but didn't know. They were Christian girls. They've all lost their way. Three of them have turned out to be atheists also. Sad. Breaks my heart when I see them on Facebook or on Instagram post nights. And I'm like, oh, goodness. How did it happen? As sad as it is, God knew the future and was protecting me from it. Amen. Fifteen years ago, as I close. I prayed a prayer. I said, Lord, close any door that you know is not for me. It may look great. It may look good. It may look perfect. Every, it checks the box, everything. But if it's not the door you want for me, close it. Now, here's the thing, Terry. When that door slams shut in your face, you're not thinking biblically then. <laughs> No, you're not. But you look back and you go, wow. Thank you, Lord, for saving me from that. Amen. You know, as we pray tonight, I want you to pray with a heart of gratitude to God. You know, you can thank God a lot. We can all thank God for the things God has saved us from that we know. What about the things he saved you from that you didn't know? What a God. What a God we serve. Father, we come to you tonight, and we just want to thank you. And we thank you for your spirit of wisdom that helps us to judge and discern properly. Your spirit of wisdom that helps us to apply the knowledge that we have gained of you. Your spirit of wisdom that helps us to recognize that certain opportunities may not be of God and from God. Father, I thank you, God, because even in our moments of confusion, your wisdom helps us see through the cloud and the chaos. And so, God, I pray for everyone in this room tonight who lacks wisdom in one realm or the other, in one dimension of their life or the other, the Lord, your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom will give them the wisdom and understanding that they need, Lord, to discern what is right, what is appropriate, what's pleasing to God. And God, tonight we pray for our Sunday service. And we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will move in a mighty and supernatural way. Lord, turn the lives of people around. Lord, heal sick bodies. Lord, bless all the men and women, boys and girls, who will step into this, this auditorium, this congregation, and say, God, we've come to seek your face. And Lord, we pray 
We pray for our loved ones who do not know you, that, Lord, they will turn to you also. And, God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will fill this place. Your Shekinah glory will be manifest to heal, save, and deliver. We thank you, God, and we praise you for your everlasting grace and mercy. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.